Yeah, everybody, God bless you, man. This is Brother Cedric Rice, New Horizons in the Word of God. And what we are doing now, today, is I want to finish up on the series that we've been doing for quite a while. And uh, in this series, I'm talking about images of Jesus Christ, which were present or given to us in the Old Testament, and more specifically, those images as they dealt with the Hebrew people in their time in the wilderness and in their journey from Egypt. And we started this series some weeks ago, and we began with um, God's calling when he called Moses to service and we just uh, um, even in that calling we just opened up a lot of analogy which is present in the scriptures alluding to the coming of our Savior before he got here and there is so much analogy in the scriptures also alluding to the work of the gospel and the function of the Godhead in the gospel and when you study and even when you hear this lesson I don't think you can ever ever like I've heard some say say that the Word of God has been tampered with because we see that this thing has been orchestrated by God himself it is not something that man could have tampered with or put together because there is just spiritually too much uh, connection, too much analogy. And, you know, I always say that the Word of God is a breathing, living document. The Word of God is alive, and God will give you whatever you need from His Word at that particular time uh, that you uh, study His Word, at that particular time that you go through His Word. He will give you whatever is necessary for him to give you at that particular time. And so the word is a breathing, living document. But without further ado, what I want to talk about this time, and this will be the last um, teaching in this series. We've come to the end of this series. And uh, we're going to have something else next week, believe it or not. Amen. You know, we're going to have something. That's just too much out there. But as far as this series is concerned, this will be the very last message out of this series. And we're going to end up here. We talked about the tabernacle. We talked about everything from the time that Moses was called until the time that, uh, that he was given the tabernacle or the uh, um, order uh, to build or to have the tabernacle built in the wilderness. And we talked about the tabernacle, the um, furnishings in the tabernacle, the construction of the tabernacle, the rooms of the tabernacle, the purposes of the tabernacle. We talked about the materials in the tabernacle. We talked about the colors used in the building of the tabernacle in, in, in the furnishings. And the last thing that we're going to talk about as far as the tabernacle is concerned are the curtains. Amen. The curtains are full of spiritual imagery. Um, the fabric of the curtains is very important. First of all, the coverings, the curtains and the coverings. We're going to talk about all of those together. But there were four coverings that covered the tabernacle. Um, each one had different, was made out of different material. We're going to get into that. Each one had a different color. We're going to get into that. Each one had a dis different uh, semblance of significance to the gospel. We're going to get into that. Uh, and, and it puts me in the mind of the four gospels. You know, four gospels were written by four different uh, of the disciples or of the original apostles. And each one of those gospels told the same story. But that story was told from the aspect of the person who wrote it. Each story was true. 
but there are a lot of differences in each gospel. Why? Because uh, um, I, an analogy I like to use is that if I put my hand in front of you and I put four people, I put one in front, one behind, or, or myself, my body, I've got my body here. If I tell four different people to describe my body to you, I let one person stand in front, I let one person stand behind me, and I put a person on the left and the right, and each four, I say, okay, describe what you see, and I want you to write it down so that it can be preserved for people to see. Well, the person who's standing in front of me is going to tell about me. But what he says is going to be a lot different from the person who's standing behind me. It's still me. But he's going to be shown different aspects of my um, uh, uh, body that other people won't see. The person behind me is going to describe probably probably the back of my bald head, my neck, my, my shoulders, back, waist, whatever. Uh, the person on the left side, he's going to see my left arm, you know, which is a little bit bigger than my right arm because I'm left-handed. And he's going to be able to describe that left side of me, that arm. And I've got some scars on my left side that I don't have on my right side. Some scars that are visible from my left side that are not visible from my right, mainly because I'm left-handed. You know, so most of the scars on my body on the left side of my body. And he's going to be able to describe those things. The person on the right side of me is going to give a very similar description, but it's not going to be exactly the same. But neither one of those persons are lying. And I say that to say this, that even in the Gospels, the Gospels give us a more complete look at how our Lord functioned as far as it, 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 it is concerned with our salvation. Uh, the Gospels just give us a look, a, 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 a four-dimensional, a three-dimensional rather look, a four-dimensional look at our Savior rather than just a one-dimensional look. And so that's, I, I'm equating that to the four different coverings that were on the tabernacle. They give us a fuller perspective of the purpose of building that tabernacle and the purpose that it served and how it pertains to our salvation. Okay, uh, let me get into my lesson. Now, the tabernacle was made of four layers of fabric, of different fabrics. Those four layers were hung on a frame of gilded wood. And so uh, the wood, of course, was the uh, 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 structure. It was the basic structure but those four layers which hung on that wood served to hold the structure together. The structure uh, are representing the truth of the gospel because a foundation must be built on truth. And so that foundation is the foundation of the gospel uh, which is built totally on truth, nothing else. There is no error in the foundation of the gospel and when people say there's error in the Holy Scriptures, then those people are sadly mistaken. Okay. Now, I'm going to start from the inside and describe what was seen on the very inside in the Holy of Holies. And then we're going to end up on the outside of the structure. And we're going to describe what was seen from the outside. Okay. Uh, 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 to the entire world. So now, the, the, what we're going to see in the Holy of Holies, the vision or the impression that that's going to have from people on the inside looking out is going to be totally different from what we will have from people on the outside looking in. So people on the outside of the gospel looking in uh, who are not saved and who are not connected with the gospel mainly see it as not an attractive thing. But, excuse me. <coughs> People on the inside looking out, they see it from God's perspective first. They're looking at it from the inside. Uh, uh, the beauty is, is on the inside because if you have the Spirit of God, it takes the Spirit of God to take you into heavenly places 
and to reveal to you the things of God. Without the Spirit of God, uh, you won't know the things of God. You won't appreciate uh, how God thinks. You won't fully know how he thinks. But certainly with the Spirit of God, you will appreciate uh, what he does and the way he does it even more. Without the Spirit of God, it will be uh, ugly, not desirable to you. I, you know, I use myself for an example. The last thing that I ever wanted to do in my life was to preach the gospel. The last thing that I ever wanted to do in my life was to get saved and be a Christian. I had no desire to do neither. God knows I didn't. And but I, I thank God for his grace that finally caught up, you know, with me. Um now that I have accepted uh, uh, uh his salvation, his redemption, his plan of redemption, and now that I'm walking in that plan and being saved, I appreciate it more than anything in the world and I'm at the point in my life now well, I'd rather just be with God and talk to the Lord and study the word and, and be around people. And I, I, it didn't used to be that way with me. But now, as far as I'm concerned, my life is so much better. But back then, as far as I was concerned, my life was better. So we see, and you, I hope you understand the analogy that I'm making here about what we see from the inside versus what we will see from the outside because that was the entire purpose of the uh, tabernacle being constructed this way okay let's start with exodus chapter 26 and we're going to do verses 1 through 14 but of course you know we're going to break it down verse by verse and we're going to work through the verses as we go along so exodus chapter 26 and verse 1 and remember we are talking about the inner covering that the priest sees from inside the tabernacle as he goes about and ministers okay Exodus 26 1 through 14 moreover thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims of, of cunning work shalt thou make them very significant ten cut ten curtains very significant the colors of blue and scarlet and purple very significant the fact that it laced or embroidered in the curtains I think is embroidered I don't know if it was embroidered or maybe dyed or drawn some kind of way but uh, 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 there's cherubims uh, uh, images of cherubims that are in those curtains very important because remembering what this is representing is God uh, 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 the inner room the inner sanctum of being with God so it's representing uh, being close to his throne being in his presence and these uh, cherubims are symbolic of what would be in the presence of God because we know, according to the word of God, that cherubim dwell in his presence. And, you know, they're listed. You know, we're not going to get into it, but anytime there is anybody in the scriptures who has described seeing God, they always describe cherubim and seraphim, which were close to him in proximity. And so if we're in the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, which represents being in the presence of God, this also is what we will see, what we will experience. Now I want to go over these colors. Very important. These curtains, first of all, there's 10 curtains. We know that 10 is God's number for righteousness. The 10 commandments of the law. There were more than 10 commandments, but God gave 10 why? Because in biblical numerology, 10 is the number for righteousness or being in right standing with God. This is why there are 10 curtains. 10 represent the righteousness of God. Remember also, this is the inner, um, 
this is the inner sanctum, the inner covering. And on this, there's, there's this inner covering, and there's three more coverings that's laid on the top of that. So the inner covering is made out of fine linen. This one particular covering is made out of fine linen, which is very important because fine linen was the best cloth that they had at that particular time. And fine linen uh, represents righteousness of God. You know, uh, the Bible talks about the church when she's made ready to be raptured. And the church uh, is described as being dressed in fine linen, white and clean, without spot or without wrinkle. And, and, and it is to be adorned in fine linen before it can be presented to God. And this fine linen represents the righteousness or the right standing of the saints of God with God the Father. Okay, now this inner covering is fine linen. The colors, blue and purple and scarlet. Amen. Blue and purple and scarlet. Why blue, purple, and scarlet? First of all, we know blue is blue. Okay, we, scarlet is red. I don't know if uh, a lot of you may not know, but scarlet is actually red. Blue is the color of the heavens, representing God the Father, representing the heavenlies. Amen. Representing that which is above, representing that which is righteous and holy. Red is the color of blood. Red represents uh, the blood which was shed for mankind in order to, uh, for that atonement to be made to connect man with God. So blue represents God in his deity or it represents Christ in his deity as the son of God. Red represents Christ as our sacrifice because he was his flesh. He was given a body of flesh in order for that flesh to be sacrificed for our redemption. So red represents God the Son on the earth. But then purple. Why purple? When you mix red and blue. And every elementary school student is, is taught this. At least most of us. I know I was taught this. When you mix red and blue together. The result is purple. Purple, God the Father, and God the Son. The Son of God, the presence of God, the person of God in a body of flesh. Amen. Our Redeemer. And that, that, that purple connected us to God in heaven. And so I'm sure that uh, if the colors were put in order, there was blue. Next to blue, there would be purple. Next to purple, that would be red in that particular order. Amen. And because, once again, the purple is the uh, uh, atonement. It represents our atonement being connected through the blood, being connected to God, uh, being adopted into the royal family, being made priests uh, in that royal family. Okay. Amen. Let me go to verses 2 and 3. Okay, we're in Exodus chapter 26, verses 2 and 3. The length of one curtain shall be 8 and 20 cubits, and the breadth of one curtain 4 cubits. So when he says one curtain, he's saying each curtain. Remember, there are ten, 10 of these curtains. And he's just giving the dimensions and the measurements. When he says the length of one He's, he's talking each. One should be translated each. Oh, I can, I can read and say the length of each curtain shall be 8 and 20 cubits, and the breadth of each curtain shall be 4 cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have one measure. Every one of the curtains shall have one measure. What he's saying is every one of the curtains should have the exact same measurement. This is what he's saying. Every one of the curtains should be the exact same size. In verse 3 says, the five curtains shall be coupled together one to another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled one to another. Very important. 
very important. For those of you who have studied biblical numerology, or do you know anything about biblical numerology? You know that five is the number of grace. And uh, uh, But here you see two times five, which is ten. And ten is the number of perfection. Ten is the number of righteousness. So grace for grace uh, brings us to righteousness. Amen. Okay, grace for grace brings us to righteousness. Um, in Zerubbabel, he talks about the mountain. He says, now when you speak to the mountain, he says, you can make that mountain a plain. And you make it a plain by shouting, grace, grace. He said it twice, grace, grace. And when you shout grace, grace to that mountain, it will make that mountain a plain. Well, the five and five, grace for grace. And even I think it's in the book of John where it talks about Jesus Christ giving grace for grace. So grace for grace brings us to righteousness or right standing with God. But these curtains, they'll couple together because the Godhead works in harmony. God works in harmony with himself. There is no ism and no skill. Amen. Each member of the Godhead has a specific function, has a specific job, and these functions tie in one to another. Okay, let's go down to uh, verses 4 through 6. But remembering once again that these curtains were made, or this inner covering is high quality linen. It's the best possible fabric that was available to them at that time. Amen. Representing that which is close to God. Representing that which is in his presence. Okay. Verses 4 through 6. And thou shalt make loops of blue among, uh, upon the edge of the one curtain from the selvage and the coupling. And likewise shalt thou make the uttermost edge of another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops shalt thou make in the one curtain and the fifty loops shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain that is in the coupling of the second. The loops may take hold one of another and thou shalt make fifty tatches of gold and couple the curtains together with the tatches and it shall be one tabernacle. Very significant. The loops were blue no man could hold together the gospel. No man can bring uh, 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 can 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 do the works of God. So the blue, the loops which connected these curtains had to be blue. Blue is that heavenly color. But then it talks about the tatches, and what the tatches are, they go in the loops. Those are metal rings. And I, I really believe what their function was is each ring would go into the loop and hold that loop to the next loop. And so you'd have the two loops and in each loop you have a tatch, which was a ring made out of gold. These tatches represent uh, uh, God's Holy Spirit, which has the power to hold all things together. Amen. We are one, you and I, uh, who are a believer. We are one through the Spirit of God. We are connected through the Spirit of God. The Gospel is connected through the Spirit of God. The Word of God is connected by the Spirit of God. The Word of God and the Spirit of God go together and the Spirit of God makes the Word of God a living, breathing document. Um, we can't, you know, the Bible talks about Paul, I think in the book of Hebrews, he talks about when the Hebrew people were in the wilderness and he said they received the Word but the word didn't profit them. He said the word profited them nothing because it was not mixed with the spirit. Amen. My teaching you, unless the spirit of God is in the words that I'm saying, those words can profit you nothing. They do you no good. You know, it's good to, to, to learn scripture, you know, but some people learn scripture just for the purpose of being able to recite scripture so that they can impress other people. And it's good to learn scripture, but learn it for the right reason. Because when we do that, we do things in the spirit of pride 
then the Spirit of God is not a part of that thing. Satan can quote scriptures, but Satan cannot speak life. Amen. When we speak the Word of God, coupled together with the Spirit of God, we should speak life. Amen. According to the Spirit of God, we should speak life. The Spirit of God attached to the Word of God brings forth life. It brings forth edification. Praise God. Amen. It brings uh, us into a closer relationship of, with God. The Spirit of God mixed with the life, the, 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 the Word of God mixed with the Spirit of God, amen, touches the hearts of believers and it will touch the hearts of unbelievers. And so this is the purpose of the gold rings which serve uh, to hold together the curtains, the, 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 the gold ring, the beaten gold rings, and they serve to hold together the curtains. And it, it's, it's important because it speaks of the work of God by his spirit in the connection of his church in the body of his believers. The apostle Peter talked about uh, um, this in a sense when he said that we are uh, all living stones built up into a spiritual house. Well, what did he mean when he said living stones? He's talking about us as believers, that we are stones. We are parts. We are, are, are the construction of the house, of the spiritual house, which is the church. But each one of us is a living stone, not just a stone. Each one of us is a spirit-filled contributor a spirit filled believer and because of the life of the spirit in God of God in us we are productive to that house and he says we're built up into a spiritual house and what's important is a, a stone is nothing of itself but what's important is we are living stones and that builds us up into a spiritual house Amen. Okay, now we talked about that inner covering. I want to go to verse 7, Exodus 26 and 7, I believe it is, and we're going to talk about that second covering. So this is the inner covering. Now we're going to talk about the covering, amen, that was uh, on top of that inner covering. Okay, let me... Okay, I went down a little bit too far. That covering was made out of ram's skin. And that's very significant. It was made out of ram's skin, and it was dyed red. Okay. So now, why in the world would uh, that covering be made out of ram's skin? And why in the world would it be dyed red? Uh, very interesting and all of this is very important first of all I want you to know that the ram skin is located right next to the fine linen the fine linen representing the holiness of God the ram skin which is dyed red and we know that red represents the blood that was shed it is the only thing that can bring us into that presence of God Amen. It's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can make an atonement. And so the very next thing next to that linen has to be that red ram's skin. Now when Moses, I'm sorry, when uh, Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac in the wilderness. And uh, Abraham understood the purpose of that sacrifice. But what God needed, he didn't need Abraham to actually go through with it. He only needed to, for his intent to be there to go through with it. Um, when Isaac was spared, and which is an analogy of mankind being spared, and, and the ram, the Bible says that Abraham found a ram in the bush. And that ram was used. To sacrifice instead of Isaac. That ram represents Christ, the sacrifice who was made for us. Amen. In order to bring us at peace or to make an atonement 
between God and man. And so this is why that very next covering is a covering made out of ram's skin. Um, in verse 7, I'm going to read verse 7. This is the third covering. And thou shalt make curtains of goat's hair to be a covering upon the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shalt thou make. The length of one curtain shall be thirty cubits, the breadth of one curtain four cubits, and the eleven curtains shall all be of one measure. So we have the linen covering, which is the inner covering, we have the ram's skin covering, which is the second covering. The third covering is goat's hair. Very significant. That third covering also was dyed black. So you had the um, fine linen, which is white, next to the fine linen, you had the ram's skin, which is red. Next to the ram's skin, you had the goat skin, which was dyed black. Uh, goats, of course, are symbolic of unsaved people. You know, the Bible talks about separating the sheep from the goats. You know, sheep are symbols of, of, of his followers. Goats are symbols, symbolic of those who do not follow or serve him. And so the ram skin separates the goats from the linen. It is the blood of Jesus that separates, that makes a separation, that separates the righteous from the, from the unrighteous. It separates the holy from the unholy. Uh, the blood of Jesus, both, uh, uh, it saves, but at the same time, it condemns. The blood of the human body, the blood of Jesus functions in the same way as the blood of the human body functions in, in every respect but what I want to mention is the fact that when blood flows through the human body after that blood has brought life-giving nutrients and life-giving oxygen to the cells of that body that same blood removes waste materials and toxins from the body and it takes it to a place where it can be eliminated. Well, the blood of Jesus, when it was shed, it brought forth separation. It brought division between righteousness and unrighteousness. Now, keep that in mind. And let me speak of uh, the sacrifice of goats. <coughs> Whenever goats were sacrificed, that was a sacrifice uh, made on the Day of Atonement. And two goats would be used for the sacrifice. Those goats represent uh, sinful people. It represents us, mankind, unredeemed men. And what would happen is that priest would lay his hand on the head of the goats. And what, when he laid his hands on the head of those two goats, that is the symbol for all of those sins, the sins of the world being placed upon those two goats. Now remember I, I told you that the blood cleanses our bodies and it brings life-giving nutrients but those things that cause death, the waste material and the toxic materials, the toxins, it removes those. And so this priest laying hands on, on those two goats is a symbol of the sins of whoever being placed on the heads of those two goats and it's a symbol of those sins being removed from mankind and placed on the heads of those two goats well the one goat was slaughtered but the other goat was taken out into the wilderness and it was let go in the wilderness and when this happened it was the symbology of that sin being placed on that goat and that goat had to bear that sin forever and ever. It was forever lost. It'd take, go to the wilderness, it'd be forever lost in the wilderness. But it would travel through the wilderness forever with the, those sins of humanity placed on it and no chance of redemption. And a lot of you probably figured out where I'm going with this. Uh, this is what happens when unredeemed people 
fail to accept uh, uh, the salvation brought by by the blood of Jesus Christ when we fail to accept his sacrifice and when we fail to accept the free gift of redemption then our sin remains on us and this is why uh, unredeemed people end up in hell and in hell they're tormented forever and ever because the guilt of that sin the punishment for that sin will remain on them forever and ever and this is why uh, one goat was released into the wilderness amen so now it was unacceptable for salvation but it, it was an object upon whom sin was placed but that object was placed upon on the ram skin amen and the ram skin served as that filter and separates the holy the linen from the unholy the goat's hair amen i hope you're with me on this i hope you're with me praise god i'm making it i i, I it is, i'm making it simple and i know a lot of you are i think most of you will be with me in what i'm saying Okay, now I want to bring a, another point I want to make. Uh, we talked about the color being black. Black, of course, symbolic uh, for sin. But I want to make another point. In this particular case, there were 11 curtains made. Amen. We talked about 10, 10 being the number of righteousness. But in this particular case, when we talk about the unrighteous goat, uh, hair covering there were 11 coverings why 11 is God's number for rebellion 10 is the number for righteousness the law but then comes in 11 is the number for righteousness 10 and 11 add 1 1 is that transgression one transgression you know one transgression uh, in violates the entire law if you break one law, you, you, you're in danger. You're in transgression of breaking them all. So 11, that's that one transgression added to the righteousness of the law. And that one transgression violates the law. And so 11 is God's number of rebellion. And it represents our flesh, rebellious, unredeemed men in their flesh. And it's very interesting that out of that covering... They made, I'm going to read verses 9 through 11. And then I'll get into that. I'll say that. Verse 9 through 11 says this. Well, verse 9. Let me start with verse 9. And thou shalt couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves. And thou shalt double the sixth curtain in the forefront of the tabernacle. Now, there were five curtains by themselves and then you had six curtains uh come on there you go get it right by themselves so you got different numbers but he, then he says that six curtain is to be a door over the entrance of the tabernacle five is god's number of grace we've talked about it six is the number for man for unredeemed man amen uh, seven is for a perfection or redeemed man uh, that's made righteous in the sight of God. Uh, not necessarily a spiritual man, but one who's righteous. But nevertheless, five is the number for grace. Six is the number for rebellion. The number six shows the rebellion of the flesh, but that six, that, that rebellion is covered by the grace of God. The grace of God, amen, uh, uh, those dyed ram skins, above the, the rebellious goat hair made man righteous in the sight of God. The blood of, of Jesus made that, that rebellious flesh righteous in the sight of a righteous God. So when God looks through that blood and he sees that flesh, then he can uh, 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 account righteousness into that flesh. Amen. Six, the number of man. This is why the number of the beast in Revelation will be 666. Six, six. What that number represents is an entity who is totally depraved, who is short of perfection in every way. Body, six. Soul, six. Spirit, six. Six, six, six. Totally depraved. Amen. Totally depraved. Totally fallen. Short 
of, of God's righteousness, short of God's perfection, short of being a perfect, uh, a perfected, mature uh, person. Amen. So we see this is very significant. And then let me get to the point also where one of those curtains is covering the entrance to the tabernacle. Also important. It is the flesh. And remember, this is the six curtains together. It is the flesh that prevents us from entering into the uh, uh, things of God. It is the flesh that hinders us in our walk with God. It is the flesh that causes us to miss out on the things of God. It is the veil of the flesh that causes us not to understand the mysteries of God. And so that one extra covering, that sixth covering, served as a door to block the entrance into the tabernacle. But in order to enter in to the presence of God, we've got to remove the covering. We've got to go beyond our flesh. Amen. We've got to get past the flesh. We've got to get out of the realm of the soul and into the realm of the spirit. And in order to do that, we have to overcome the lust and the desires of our flesh. Okay, let me read verses 10 and 11. Let's move on. And thou shalt make 50 loops. Here again, 50. I think I told you, if I didn't tell you, 50 is the number of the Holy Ghost. I think maybe I didn't, but 50 is the number of the Holy Ghost. It's the number of Pentecost. Uh, it's the number of the, the fire from heaven, the Spirit of God coming down from heaven. The day of Pentecost was 50 days after Jesus was resurrected from the grave. At 50 days later came Pentecost. He stayed and he taught his disciples for 40 days. He ascended into heaven and 10 days after he ascended, then Pentecost, fire came down from heaven. Uh, Elisha the prophet, when the king sent captains of 50 to go capture Elisha and to bring him back, Fire from heaven came and destroyed each one of those groups of 50 soldiers. And it's very significant. 50, uh, uh, the Spirit of God, Pentecost, fire from heaven. And so this is why we have the 50 loops. But I want to I show you something. These 50 loops are a little bit different from the 50 loops on the inside. Let me read it and I'll show it to you. And thou shalt make 50 loops on the edge of the one curtain that is outmost in the coupling and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain which coupleth the second. And see that curtain was connected on one side. 50 loops on that curtain, 50 loops on one side connecting it to the rest. See, and so one side was open so you could move it back and enter in, okay. And 50 loops on the edge of the curtain which coupleth the second. And thou shalt make 50 Tatches of brass and put the tatches in the loops and couple the tent together that it may be one. Now notice that the first tatches that we talked about in the inner part of the sanctuary were made of gold representing the power of God the righteousness of God holding together the gospel. These tatches on the goat's hair covering are made out of brass. Brass is a metal which is symbolic of flesh, of sin, of the sinfulness of flesh. When you see brass used in the Bible spiritually, it always depicts unredeemed, well, not, not necessarily unredeemed, but it always depicts human flesh which has been affected by sin. Amen. Not necessarily always unredeemed, but flesh which has been affected, uh, which had at one time been fallen. This is what brass represents. And so now you see these connectors on this goat hair's covering, which represents the sinfulness of the flesh, are made out of brass. And those connectors on the linen covering, which represent the righteousness of God, were made out of gold. See, these things are very significant. And God doesn't do anything by accident. He doesn't do anything by error. And he doesn't do anything just to be doing something. 
everything in this word is significant in one way or another. God knows what he's doing. Amen. But everything that he put in here is significant. Uh, whether we realize it or whether not, or whether we don't realize it. But everything has a purpose with God and everything has a meaning. And he may reveal that meaning as he sees fit to us at sundry or different or various times during our walk. Okay, let's go to verses 12 and 14. And when we do that, we'll finish up on the curtains and then we'll talk about uh, the cleft in the rock. Verse 12 says this, And the remnant that remaineth of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remaineth, shall hang over the backside of the tabernacle. And a cubit on the one side, and a cubit on the other side of that which remaineth in the length of the curtains of the tent, it shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle, on this side and on that side to cover it. And thou shalt make a covering for the tent, a ram skin dyed red, and a covering above, a badger skin. <clears throat> we talked about the ram skin earlier, but the top covering was badger's skin. The significance of badger skin, first of all, it was not attractive at all. Uh, so to look at the tabernacle from the outside to see the badger skin, it was not attractive. God didn't do anything to this badger skin to decorate it. He didn't do anything to this badger skin to really make it look presentable. But it was an outside covering in that it took the effects of the weather. The rain would rain on it. Uh, if ever it rained in the wilderness, which I don't know if it did or not, but if it, if it thundered and lightning, the thunder and lightning would get on it. Uh, in a windstorm, the dust, it would protect everything from dust because badger skin is so good at, at being a sealant. And this represents our flesh, the actual flesh of our bodies. Um, of course, we know the flesh has the function of protecting the body just as the badger skin protected the inside of the tabernacle. But our flesh is the depository for things which are, let me say, negative or things which are, are, are not um, sent from God. You know, the enemy uses the flesh to try to control us. He, he uses emotions and fear and all of this other stuff to try to affect us in our flesh and to cause us to act according to the flesh. And so we see the flesh, uh, the badger skin rather on top of the tabernacle was there to divert these things. Okay, so much for the tabernacle. And, but, but to look at it from the outside, I make this point. To look at the tabernacle from the outside, there is nothing that would be desirable to it. And so those who have not accepted uh, the gospel, those who not, have not accepted the salvation or the redemption that was offered by our Savior are not particularly attracted to those things of the gospel but those of us who have then we see it from the inside and we see the beauty of being a part of the family of God we see that beauty from the inside while those who are not saved they only see the unattractive to them is very unattractive from the outside because they still looking they're being led by the light from the world and remember the only light in the tabernacle was the light from the lampstand, the golden lampstand, which represents uh, 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 Christ, the tree of life, and what we receive, the revelation and the knowledge that we receive from him. Okay, that's so much for the curtains in the tabernacle. The last thing that I want to talk about today is the cleft in the rock, the cleft in the rock. And this is important. It's very short. It's not going to take long at all. But it's very important. You know, it's often overlooked, not thought about, not taught about. Because most people don't understand the significance and the imagery that's located there. But we're going to do that. That's going to be the last subject on this particular series. It's going to be the last thing I talk about in this particular series. It has been a wonderful series. I have enjoyed it so much. Amen. But we finally come to the end. Okay, the cleft in the rock. Exodus chapter 33, verses 17 through 22 are our verses. Exodus 17 
33. Uh, I'm sorry, Exodus 33, 17 through 22. I'm going to read uh, 17 and 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Here Moses has served God well. He's been chosen by God for the uh, very arduous task of leading his people out of Egypt and through the wilderness. God had to have a man that he could trust. That's, therefore, he chose Moses. He had to have a man who was loyal to him. Even though Moses wanted to quit and give up, God had to have a man who would not quit and he, who would not give up. And so Moses has served God all of these years. And uh, so now Moses asks, well, you know, I want to see your glory. And Moses spent time with God. He spent the 40 days and 40 nights with God up on Mount Sinai. And I really believe that for that entire time, he was in a trance and he, he was spiritually in the presence of God. And this is what God gave him. The first five books of the Bible, this is where God gave him uh, the pattern for the tabernacle and many other things that we uh, don't read about. And so now Moses makes this request. He said, look, Lord, I've never, you've done all of this, but I've never seen you in your fullness. I've never seen you in your glory. So he says, show me your glory. Amen. Okay. In verses 18 through 20. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, this is the Lord, I will make all of my goodness pass before thee. Okay, so it's going to pass in front of you. My glory, my beauty, my goodness. It's going to pass in front of you, Moses. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Now God had to limit his exposure to Moses because Moses is yet in a body of unredeemed flesh. And if he were to be fully exposed to the glory of God, that sinful flesh would be destroyed in the presence of God. And so God says, okay, I, I'll do it for you. But understand now, there's got to be some conditions so that I can do this and, and not kill you. And, you know, he's going to go into the conditions. But, you know, he says he'll be gracious to whom he will be gracious. He'll be merciful to whom he will be merciful. And I just want to bring out something on that just very quickly. And I'm sure a lot of us know people and it seems like God is blessing them and doing so much for them. And a lot of us know, you know, those people are not living for I'm sure you know somebody that's got some kind of terrible secret that you know. You know, you hopefully you're not saying anything about it, but you know, but you see God blessing them. You know, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace does more abound. So you can't look at what God is doing in somebody's life and equate it to the type person that they are because God will bless the sinner. But you know, God will do this in order to win him over. Amen. He'll allow. You know, people say sinners can't be blessed. Yes, they can. God will bless a sinner knowing he won't be saved. He may do something for the Lord, but he won't, if he doesn't accept salvation, he's not going to be saved. But God will give him something for what he did on this earth. Amen. And, and and so, you know, I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen it in Scripture. But nevertheless, okay, he tells Moses, he says, I'm going to make everything uh, uh, pass before you. But he says, in order for me to do this, he says, I'm going to have to hide you. Let me look at verses 21 through 23. And the Lord said, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Amen. How many of y'all know that that rock was Jesus Christ? That rock was that same rock that Paul talked about, which followed the Hebrew people through the wilderness. Our righteousness is based upon 
the sacrifice that Jesus made. So he told him, you're going to stand upon a rock. The only way that you can see my glory is you're going to stand upon a rock. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so Moses has to stand upon the rock. And I guarantee you that rock is the rock that Paul says, the apostle Paul says, that followed them when they were in the wilderness. Okay, thou shalt stand upon a rock, verse 22, and it shall come to pass while my glory passes by that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. Praise God. A cliff in the rock. A cliff is a break or an opening. God tells Moses, I'm going to make a break in this rock. And I'm going to hide you in that cliff, that break, that opening. That cliff, a man, represents the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What was done. He was wounded. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Or the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed the cliff you're going to hide he says I'm going to have to hide you amen in that sacrifice I'm going to have to hide you to, to protect you from my wrath because Jesus took all of the wrath that God had stored up for mankind all of that wrath was poured out on him so that it would not be poured out on us who deserved it. And this is the cliff that God is going to hide Moses in. It's going to hide him and save him from the wrath of God, which honestly and righteously should fall on him. He says, I'm going to cover you. In that cliff, I can cover you. I'm going to cover you with my hand so that what you see will not kill you. What you experience won't hurt you. Amen. Okay. All right. Verse 23. And I will take away mine hand. After he walks by, he says, I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Moses could only see the back part. Moses was the giver of the law. Moses uh, wrote the, the five, first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. So, the Spirit of God had not yet come. The sacrifice had not yet occurred. Redemption had not yet been made. Christ is hidden all in here, in what I gave you today, in a mystery. The mystery had not been revealed to man, because man didn't have the Spirit of God. It takes the Spirit of God to reveal the things of God. And so he tells Moses, you can't see my face. You can't see what it's really going to be. But I'm going to let you be. I'm going to let you see my hinder parts. And that will give you an impression. It will give you an idea. Just a vague idea of what I am in, in the law. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant is all images. It's all analogies. It gives us a vague idea. Amen. Of what he is. Of who we serve. But it doesn't tell us the full picture. It uses symbolism. And it gives us vague ideas. And they didn't get it. And he couldn't see it. Why? Because it was not yet time for that mystery to be revealed. But praise God, saints, we as Old Testament saints. Oh, I'm sorry, as New Testament saints. Old, Old Testament saints couldn't look into that mystery. But to us. New Testament saints, the mystery of salvation has been revealed. And so we are blessed. You know, Jesus uh, told his disciples, he said, you see me, but blessed is the man who doesn't see me and yet believes. The man who doesn't see him physically and yet believes is that man, a man who receives 
uh, 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 the mystery, who sees the mystery, who God reveals, to whom God reveals that mystery. That man is blessed. Blessed is the man that doesn't see me, but yet believe. And look at the word of God. Nobody can tell me that the Bible is not written, amen, by the hand of God, by the spirit of God, through the hands of men. Nobody can tell me that the Bible is not inspired word of God. You can't tell. There's no way you can make me, you, can, you can't do anything to make me believe otherwise because when I read the word and I study the word and, 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 and the spirit of God leads me and guides me in the word of God. And God reveals himself even out of the old covenant. Praise God. It strengthens my faith and it should strengthen your faith. This is the biggest faith strengthener. Signs and wonders are good. But nothing can strengthen your faith uh, like the revealed word of God. And that's the end of the series. I appreciated it. I thank you, Lord, for giving it to me. I thank you for opening up your word. And I certainly hope and pray that everybody that views this will be blessed. This is uh, Brother Cedric Rice, New Horizons in the Word of God. Amen. I'll be back with something else next week. Guarantee it. Amen. As the Lord wills. As the Lord wills. But uh, for everybody that happens to see this video, praise God. Until I hear your voice, until you hear my voice, until you see my face, or I see your face again, I certainly hope and pray that every day of your life is the best day of your life. God bless you.